Well, hello and welcome to another podcast. It's, uh, me, Hugh Waters, over here in Gloucestershire, and Phil over there in London. Oh, look, he's pointing at the various things, <laughs> so we know roughly where everybody is. Uh, but today we've got a, a, a special topic. I'm used to colour bars. I now understand my way around them. I look at colour bars and feel at home and, and at peace. But Phil tells me that we don't use colour bars like today to test everything, that there are things that can get past colour bars. So today we're going beyond colour bars. Phil, yeah. Yes, oh, oh. this this um, comes from a, uh, a magazine article I wrote last summer for one of the trade inkies, and I can't remember which one, might be broadcast film and video. Um, and the, the, the title was The Challenges of Modern, Modern Picture Quality Analysis, which was a bit of a mouthful. And I, yeah. I, the, 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 whole, the whole kind of thrust of it was... You know, back when we were youngsters, um, you know, that's so I've got it up on screen now. That I, I, oh, yeah. I hope you can see that. Um, uh, you yeah. know, monitoring a composite video signal was a very important thing because uh, what's happened uh, going down that analog coaxial cable or through that distribution amplifier or, or through that microwave link transponder system or whatever, what, what happened to the analog signal uh, had an impact on how the pictures looked, uh, you know, because, you know, peak video was represented by 700 millivolts, uh, uh, you know, at the top of the, the signal, um, right up there, if I wiggle my mouse about, uh, and, and and the, the dark parts of the picture were represented by the luminance on, on the, the zero level down there, and obviously we've got sinks down there at, at, at 0.3 of a volt below uh, the zero black level, and then we, you know, we have the, the, the obviously the colour burst, which is right up there at yeah. 4.43 megahertz, and, and so whatever happens to that analogue signal, that had an impact on pictures, uh, you, you know, if if uh, if a level was compromised, if the lovely uh, you know 0.7 of a volt peak white at the start of the path. Um, you know, got attenuated down to 0.5 of a volts, the pictures would get visibly dimmer. And mm -hmm. and if the black level, if, there, if a DC level was introduced onto the signal, the black parts of the picture, the dark parts of the picture would rise up and we'd, we'd everything would look milky and we'd lose, you know, the look of the picture. Uh, similarly, if in the frequency domain, if if the low frequency part of the signal, if, if you know, right down there at kind of, you know, hundreds of kilohertz was being compromised, we'd get a roll off in, in the flat level performance of the color bars. And so, uh, large objects would kind of become shaded, uh, or if 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 the signal was rolling off at the high frequency end, up at sort of 5.5 megahertz, which was the sort of the limit of analog television, standard definition analog television, then we'd start to notice a loss of detail in the picture. And with with, with a, a composite system where you've got um, all the color information right up there at the high part of the spectrum, so up at 4.43 megahertz, uh, where the subcarrier lives. Um, you know, if, if the high frequency part of the the signal path was being compromised, then obviously our pictures would get desaturated as yeah. the as as the as the as the chroma information was compromised, and then you got lots and lots of very uh, sort of interesting um, things like chroma luma delay inequalities, where maybe a, a path was delaying the low frequency parts of the picture differently to the high frequency parts of the picture, and so you'd get kind of color fringing around objects, and so anything that could bedevil the analog signal, anything that could affect the passage of that analog signal down a cable through a piece of equipment across a link or whatever had real impact on the pictures and and of course you know that's what, how engineers made their bread and butter they spent all their time yeah. lining up da's you know calibrating Tweaking things and adjusting. yeah so, so, so that pictures look good at the other end you know that's that, that's what we yeah. did for most of the time you know, I, I remember you know all my time being spent in studios lining up camera da's doing this thing, you know just to make sure that the pictures were faithfully reproduced but of course come the come the 1990s and we all kind of moved to, to digital video, um, yeah. now everything's being represented by um, by numbers going down a cable, and it either gets there or it doesn't. Well, within limits, you know, if something mm. if something gets too compromised, you get green splats and pink splats on the picture, but eventually, you know, that it will the, the picture will fall over. But we're no longer, uh, uh, you know, the slave of the analog performance of the signal path. We're now having to deal much more with um, uh, a digital path, and so consequently, kind of people really stop looking at waveform monitors and oscilloscopes you know what why would you need to and if i just spin my camera a bit here you can see i've got oh, um, i've got my trusty uh, tektronix setup here uh, yeah. I've, I've stuck a big uh, monitor on top of it so oh, yeah. you, can, you can see what's on there but in fact by the magic of of com magic of computer networks i can <laughs> i can i can see what's on the tektronix here and if i'm just going to recall a preset if i stab that button there so that's um and i'm going to refresh that display there we can see that there's a there's our, our, our component color bars. So that's a, an SDI signal uh, uh, going into my Tektronix. And that's, that, that's a real honest-to-goodness representation 
of the numbers that are coming down the cable. Uh, so we've got, we've got our, our, our luminance signal there, the black and white portion of the picture, stored at full resolution. And then we've got our two uh, uh, color difference signals, the, 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 the CB and the CR, um, stored at half resolution. It's a 422 signal coming down the cable. Now, it just so happens this is a, this is a 1080i, uh, you know, 1080, 50 interlaced field signal. Uh, Tektronix is telling me that down there. Uh, but um, if, if this is what you're dealing with, then, you know, for a QC engineer or somebody who's doing, you know, taking care of, of playing as program to air, uh, you don't really have to worry about all those those practical uh, physical uh, faults anymore of, of the performance of DAs, of, of how well a cable's behaving. And, and the point of looking at video levels now falls much, much back onto the the editor he has to pay attention or the or the racks engineer the person yeah. who's 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 taking care of that because as we know um uh it's it's not the case everything that makes pictures like cameras and telecine machines and things like that you know computer graphics workstations they'll generate pictures in the rgb domain because that's how your eyes work and then and then i've got a little picture here of a dichroic block yeah. and it's a familiar principle you know the color picture yeah. is split into three component parts and you think well fantastic we we deal with the rgb but we don't for the most part in television we deal with uh, YCBCR, and in fact, there's a there's a grab from another uh, Tektronics, and you can see uh, yeah, it doesn't take very much imagination, does it, to, to run your eye along the first waveform, the luminance waveform, and relate that to the bars, and and the other two waveforms are the blue color difference and the and the, and the red color difference. And in fact, go back and look at our second video 101 podcast if you want to find out a bit more about that because we talked about that a lot back then. But of course, now now we're beholden to some some equations, and, and there's the equations there for Rec 601 standard definition television. That the Rec 709, the high definition television ones, are very, very similar, but um, are slightly different. And so therein lies some of our issues. Uh, for a start, we're not dealing with uh, uh, the, the, the RGB numbers, how they were acquired. We're dealing with a different representation, and that's done for jolly good reasons, for you know being able to you know deal with the signal in the ways we want to. But transcoding from RGB to YCBCR... Um, is one thing, and in fact, if you look at those those yeah those three equations there, those sort of mathematical recipe for going between YCBCR, sometimes called YUV by very lazy engineers, uh, and, <laughs> and 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 RGB, you could sit there all day long flipping between the two, you know, and no quality would be lost, and 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 you know the world would be a good place. Um, it's only when you have to start you know trimming the YCBCR down to four two two to start saving bandwidth like that, 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 that problems creep in if you're worried about ultimate picture quality, but. Uh, if, if, for example, your edit workstation is 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 generating its own pictures, so captions or your grading or or it's it's changing picture picture content in the YCBCR color space, uh, mathematically, unless you go back to RGB, it's very hard to know if you've got uh, legal illegal or or legal colors. I think yeah. if you do the if you if you work it out for ten bit video, I think. Uh, more than half of the combinations of YCBCR transcode back to illegal RGB, and I'll and I'll show you this with. Um, I'm just, I hadn't realised it was as high as that actually. Yes, you know, let's let's jump forward a couple of clips here. This is a um, this is a uh, uh, some material that that I shot, or in fact, one of my friends shot at Route Six on a 5D Mark II, which is a, a digital SLR, uh, but but is used very widely in television. And so, yeah. if I go back to my. Uh, uh, Tektronics display here, and I'll just do a refresh to force it to re-grab the uh, the uh, the, um, the instruments display. And so we're looking there at, at our, our YCBCR signal, and a quick glance at that, and you think, "Well, oh, that's fantastic! I can see the peak parts of the picture are just about hitting 700 millivolts. There's nothing sub-black, so that's all nice. And the two color difference signals, that the, the the CB and the CR, they look as if they're well contained within the uh, the limits of of the 700 millivolts. No worries there. That would appear to be a perfectly acceptable picture, and you could record that on a VTR and play it back, and it would be fine. However, if I am um, now um, take my Tektronics and we look at an RGB display, which Tektronics excel at. They're really very, very good. And I'll refresh my my browser window here so you can you can see it on, on this screen. So this is uh, you know, the, the proprietary Tektronics uh, diamond display. And, yeah. uh, and what, what it's showing us is in the top diamond, it's plotted uh, green against blue. So it's transcoded the YCBCR back to RGB as it would have been acquired in the camera. And it's plotted in the top half of the uh, of the double diamond um, 
uh, uh, green against blue, and in the bottom half of the diamond, green against red. And in the very centre part where the two diamonds meet, that's the very dark parts of the picture. And at the extremes, sort of top and bottom in the centre, that's the, the very bright parts of the picture. And so immediately your eye is drawn to uh, the, 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 sort of the bottom uh, diamond, and you can see uh, down there, oh, we've got my mouse, down there... Um, um, uh, yes. uh, there, uh, that's obviously very, very out of gamut as far as uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know the RGB uh, color space is concerned. And is the gamut defined by the the, the light yellow uh, dash? The small. Uh, we, well, actually, the Tektronix very helpfully shows us both Rec seven hundred nine and Rec six hundred one gamuts on the same instrument. And ah, uh, right, again, okay. we I think we talked a little bit about that, oh, a couple of years ago now, but, ago, but, yeah, but, yeah. but there are reasons for that. But but uh, but even even at Rec seven hundred nine, the slightly wider gamut, yes. we can see that we've got stuff uh, coming out of the color space here in the in the in the green and red part of the picture. Which guess what? It's that very saturated yellow color. Can you see very very ah, yes. saturated surround of the of the coffee shop uh, just at the end entrance of the Muse where Route Six is the uh, the breakfast club, very popular coffee shop with the youngsters. Um, uh, now the thing about the the the, 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 the diamond display is that it's engineered to um, uh, exaggerate these errors. Uh, you know, it's engineered to draw your eye immediately to where you've got errors. And so it's it's why colorists love the diamond display. Or in fact, there's there's another one that Tektronix do called the Arrowhead Display, which I'll put that full screen and refresh my browser here so we can have a look at that. Uh, and, and, and again, this is this is a kind of like an engineered display because it, it plots um, uh, luminance up this axis, up, up, the ver up the vertical axis there, and then it plots the two color difference channels along there. Again, not quite so good at showing you RGB errors, but 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 really quite good for, for as, as a kind of a one-stop shop for letting your eyes see if there's any uh, errors in the YUV data, but um, you know that, it's why colorists love um, uh, the, the diamond display. That that, uh, that that it's why very, you very know Tektronix is the one you see in, in grading suites all over the place, um, and so clearly uh, you can have pictures that look okay uh, in YCBCR, but the, the, but there are illegal colors as we can we can see on the display there, right right down at the bottom there. And in fact, if I if I look around there, that there is some uh, illegality in the green end of things as well. And looking at it, it looks like it's it's down the left-hand side of the picture there. Just um, for um, anybody that's wondering, uh, when you say illegal, what is the effect of it? Does that mean you can't pass it through the transmission chain? What happens? Well, okay, so 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 twenty years ago, uh, uh, where the transmission chain was lar largely analog, uh, uh, the, the effects of illegal video would be unpredictable. So so maybe yeah. maybe a DA would clip colours, in which case you'd get that kind of false colour effect. Uh, if you think about that David Bowie uh, early 80s promo, Ashes to Ashes, oh, yeah. they exploit that quite a lot. The sky is that kind of false colour, and that's just because yeah. they've, they've over-colour corrected the picture, and they've put it through a clipper, and that's what you get. It looks, it looks quite yeah. unnatural. Uh, you know, so it was, it was essentially unpredictable. Of course, nowadays, oh, you, know, you could argue, does it really matter? You know, if I've shot something on a camera onto a memory card, I've ingested that memory card into my Avid for cutting it, uh, I've finished it, and I've transcoded it to an AVCI 100 megabit file for my DPP, deliverable i'm a, a modern facility doing modern stuff does it really matter you know if colors were illegal at all because at no point between the camera and the viewer will these pictures actually be turned back into baseband video well they will in the set top box at the consumer's home but domestic tellies have got huge gamuts by comparison with rec 709 which comes to the early 90s and you know the system's entirely capable of carrying all these illegal colors why are we so worried well you know it's it's kind of all to play for still, isn't it? And presumably as, as ultra-high definition television 4K comes in and yeah. we start to embrace wider colour spaces like Rec uh, 2020, uh, you know, these things will become less of an issue and we'll have more sensible ways of dealing with it. You know, I'm sure nobody on YouTube worries about illegal colours. <laughs> you know, and, and I watch YouTube uh, in HD on my big telly because it's got, because my, my, my set-top box has got YouTube on it and it looks fantastic, you know, no complaints. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, so, 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 so that's one thing. Clearly, when you transcode from YCBCR to RGB, or if you make colours in YCBCR, which you know, if you're editing on Avid, if you're editing on FileCut, you are probably and and you're generating, say, a coloured edge for a wipe, or you're or you're doing some grading, or you're making some titles, you are generating those colours in YCBCR. So you risk illegality. Um, so that's one thing that is now an issue that was never really an issue. And it's why editors still have to pay attention to uh, the waveform monitor in their suite. Uh, but of course, the other the, the other thing that, that really uh, is um, uh, the um, 
the, the reason uh, why we still have to check things is because typically we're doing things now in a uh, a time domain. We're compressing things. Yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're, 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 we're not dealing with pixels anymore. We're dealing with macro blocks. We're, we're dealing with those yeah. compressed objects. Um, and and so that's something that, that that is very important. But before we get to that, I'm, I'm just going to a few a, a, a little resource. This is uh, this is a website that I've used often. It's uh, Bell New Bell uh, I think they're Swiss uh, uh, Effects House, and they put up lots of useful things online. And um, and the Bell New Montage Test Chart uh, t- typifies a lot of these things. So if I go to there, and I think no, I haven't got it open. Thought I had it open. Right, so let's go back to the browser. And let's open it up. Um, so here it is, and if I take that full screen, uh, this has got some very useful things in it, uh, which uh, highlight problems uh, that typically occur when you run things through encoders, uh, and as well as all the sort of the, uh, the sort of uh, markers for. In, in the case of this one, it's markers for digital film deliverables. So you've got the 185 to 1 marker there, yeah. which is what um, digital film people refer to as the flat raster. So that's, um, what is that? That's uh, 2048 by 854 pixels. Yeah, the 2K deliverable standard for, for DCP. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got the 166 uh, raster there, which is uh, the um, anamorphic raster. Uh, and, 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 and so you can tell if something's been cropped incorrectly at 2K. That's rather nice. But you've also got uh, sort of level markers. Uh, so so as, as we know, when we're dealing with RGB to YCBCR transcodes, not only do we have to apply that mathematical transform to make the numbers work, but we also have to scale the video as well. We don't use full range video for, for YCBCR. We use a, a slightly limited range, uh, 16 to 235 if you're dealing with 8-bit video. Uh, but 10-bit is a similar range. I can't remember the numbers. Um, uh, 64 to... can't remember. Uh, but here we've got... This is rather splendid. We've got uh, a 235 patch there. And then here we've got the RGB values either side of it. So mm-hmm. if we've imported this into a, into an Avid... Uh, and typically these things are about checking workflows. So it's checking that the stuff the graphics guy sent me, I'm importing it correctly into my Avid and I'm not crushing my blacks, I'm not um, chopping my whites. Uh, and, so, and so being able to import this just before you import the TIFFs the graphic guy sent you, you can you can check to make sure that your import route is correct, and you can you know uh, you can see where things are being sliced. Similarly in the blacks, the other nice thing is we've got a rendering here of the primary colours using the six oh nine numbers and the seven oh nine numbers. Now, if you've imported a uh, a, a six oh one raster source into a seven oh nine timeline, uh, you will see a difference between these two. But if you've done it correctly, the, the the red should match and 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 the blue should match. And that's that's again that's rather handy. It's, it's the very devil to tell that on pictures, but having this is quite an easy thing. Now this is a this is a little freebie test chart that they give you, and there's quite a few other little doodads and bits and bobs here for sort of blacks and super blacks that you can use. But um, the, uh, the, the 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 one that uh, really uh, there we go. Get rid of that. The the one that really uh, I find very useful is is the one by SRI, the Visualizer. Uh, now this is a paid for product, and it's available either as, as as a as a baseband product, as a test signal generator, or it's available as a, as a file license, so you can drop it into your file workflow. Uh, but before we get to that, there's there's the, the other thing that's very useful for testing in the time domain is is for lip sync testing, and there are loads of them on YouTube. And these are the ones I've sort of downloaded uh, in in high def. And tested, and they are bang on accurate. So it's something like this: um, uh, what you got on your computer screen may not be of huge use, but you can see there as it, as it passes through the centerpiece, you get a nice bip, and yep. it's very easy to spot if you're frame late, frame early on your on your um, uh, picture sync, picture to audio relationship. Um, but uh, the real power of these things is that uh, you, you know, if you, if you, so if you if you wind it up to 1080. There it is, and uh, you've always got the option of, of downloading these things. Uh, you know, as MP4, it's very useful. Um, so, uh, so, so again, you know, that's that's a kind of a useful uh, test pattern with a time d- domain uh, to it. It's kind of a useful thing to have in your toolbox, and you can you know, you can keep it, uh, you know, on your PC, and then you know if you keep if you keep a little um, uh, you know SDI interface in your in your rucksack, which I do, they're not expensive now. You can pick up the little AJA T tap for a couple of hundred quid. That's just a very useful test signal to have to be able to hose into a big monitor, be you know to test it for, for lip sync issues. But 
The one uh, I really like, um, and I'll stick it up on my big monitor back here, is is this thing, the um, the SRI visualizer. Uh, and uh, uh, so can we? Uh, you can see that, but I can I can actually stick it up. I've got a quick time of it here on my laptop. Um, and uh, just momentarily, I'll take that full screen and just let it play a while. Uh, and you can hear that ticks as well as it goes through the centre portion. Oh yeah. And, uh, and there's quite a few things on here. This this is really quite a, a useful one. Um, uh, so uh, if I pause that a second, we can sort of explain a few of them. Um, I'm going to get rid of that a little bit. Move that out of the way. There we go. Can't get off screen entirely, but but the the, the 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 first thing that's worth noticing is is you can see down here uh, uh, in this little piece here, this square here, it's got these yeah. kind of um, uh, what are clearly uh, uh, CB and CR, you, you know, red color difference and blue color difference wheels emanating from the bottom and going up to the top. Now, what this shows you is. Uh, the resolution of your of your color difference signals, and in a four two two signal, you'd expect to see the resolution uh, make it all the way to the top there, because obviously in four two two you've got full resolution in the vertical direction. But you expect yeah. it to run out of resolution about halfway along the horizontal, because you've only got half the resolution compared to luminance going in the in the in the, in the horizontal direction. Uh, but if, for example, You've put your pictures through a transcoder or any, uh, you know, a, a new edit workflow or something like that. Uh, you wouldn't notice if you were accidentally subsampling them down to four one one. You'd be really hard pushed to notice those on pictures. The only thing you might notice is you weren't able to maybe pull as clean a chroma key. Uh, but with this, you immediately see that you've got you've run out of resolution halfway along each axis. So I can tell you for sure these pictures have been downsampled to four one one. I can further confirm that these started off as four 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 pictures as RGB pictures, and they've been downsampled to four one one because I can actually see reflections coming back along the axes here. Very, ah, very, very geez. useful. On a, on a high-quality monitor using you know, Dual Link or 3G444 signals, you expect to see these wheels getting all the way to the top. If you see them getting yeah. to the top here but not, but not here, well, they're, they're 422 pictures that haven't been fiddled about with. If you see a reflection coming back along here, you know it's been downsampled. Uh, and so that is again, it shows you something pictorially that you, you, you couldn't measure on a Tektronix and would be the very devil to see on real pictures. So an, another useful thing is this piece here. This is a, a rotating color wheel, uh, very shallow color ramps up at uh, uh, the last sort of two bits of res uh, two bits of dynamic range. And so if all you can perceive there is a slight kind of movement, then everything's good. But if your pictures have been downsampled from ten bits to eight bits, all of a sudden you see big steps here, and it's very very obvious that uh -huh. something's gone wrong. So again, you wouldn't see it on pictures, but it's very easy to see it on here. Uh, what else have we got? We've got these are the ST303 colors. And so if you're worried about color performance through a transcoder, through an encoding machine of some sort, uh, uh, over and above um, a grayscale, you can aim your colorimeter at these points here and see if, if they really are faithfully reproducing the colors. Um, these are, these are um, uh, uh, horizontal and vertical uh, uh, frequency gratings extending up to the Nyquist limit. So again, if your transcoder or whatever is doing something nasty, then you'll see it. And in fact, we can see that when I made the quick time here, clearly I've I've kind of, um, you know, it's it's I'm losing resolution up at the top here. But yeah. in a sense, it's kind of good to see it. Um, yeah. uh, what else have we got on the go here? So this piece here, this is very interesting. This is a compression uh, uh, grating. And so if I, if I play it again, you can see that all these compression gratings are moving. And and what we have yeah. along the top here is lines of TV resolution. Oh, so I, I so I must have rendered this out at seven twenty. Yes, I did. Um, and I've got bits of bits of di uh, of uh, dynamic range bit depth down the side here. Uh, they only go up to uh -huh. eight bits because every every encoder in the world is an eight bit device. You really only deal with ten bit video, you know, in the post production facility. Once you've tr encoded it for broadcast or for going over a satellite link, it's coming in at eight bits. So so on a good quality monitor. With an uncompressed signal, you can see a moving grating all the way up to here. But as compression starts to bite, you lose detail up here. And you know, if something's really compressed, you know, you, you, you're sort of losing it all the way down to here. And this is a very good uh, test because essentially it means you can uh, do a very honest uh, assessment of of how hard compression's biting without having to have access to the uncompressed pictures. So you could run your pictures through your satellite connection, which I had to do actually recently with uh, with a customer, 
and ask the person at the other end, the guy at the receiving TV station, what are you seeing? You know, where where are you? Where, where can where can you see the last bit of moving grating in each of these columns? And then using that, you can work out the PSNR, uh, uh, the, the uh, peak signal to noise ratio of of the compression value, which you know kind of is is quite a useful thing to be able to tell. Yeah. But again, w- w- without something like this, you're talking about you know an expensive compression meter and access to the uncompressed and the compressed video, which is kind of hard. Yeah. Uh, what else we've we got? We've got this is rather nice. This is called the lava lamp, and, and this is rendered to be optically smooth and doubling in speed every one of these big boxes here, right. and. And so you'll notice that on this side it's it's a uh, it's chrominance only it's CB and CR yeah. and on this side it's luminance only, and so if you had uh, if something was was dropping a frame every n frames or it was missing a field every n fields you'd notice it on here you'd notice yeah. one of these jumping and bumping. Now I was on a job I tell you how long ago it was it was when they were building the London Eye. And uh, the OB that was covering uh, a particular part of the job, I think they were they were floating the uh, the pods down the Thames. They came down on barges and then they were attached. Mm. The OB had some issue where, and um, we never figured out whether it was the BT facility line or whether it was happening at the OB. But every five fields in the CR channel, it was doing a field double. So on frame one, on frame two, it was okay, but frame three. Uh, you were getting a double uh, red colour difference field. And for most of the time, you couldn't see it. You couldn't see it on pictures. Uh, but when you had a quick camera pan, you got funny red fuzzy edges around things, and it was very hard to yeah. put your finger on. If I'd have had this, I could have been able to tell in an instant what was going on. I, I'd have been able to see immediately what was going on. But, uh, you know, back then it was like a day's worth of head scratching. And what on earth is this effect, you know? How on earth did they do it? You never did find out. We never got to the bottom of it, no. It was all over. And and the, the few shots it, it, it kind of bedeviled, we kind of you didn't use them or whatever, you know? There's some other things here. We've got we've got sort of uh, so I mean, obviously we know what what traditional pluge looks like, where you can set the black on a monitor. But here we've got, and again I've rendered it to QuickTime, so it's very hard to say see on this version. But we've got uh, neg two, neg one, zero, <coughs> uh, one, two, three. I think we go up to four percent black here. So not only can we see if our black's being rendered uh, correctly, but we can see if our encoder is biting into sub blacks or if it's actually biting into blacks in the picture. And we've got a similar thing here with we've got four white chips going from 97, 98, 99. No, nice. 98, 99, 100, 101. So we can see if our encoder is biting into into white, into super white or into real whites. It's kind of useful. Now, the other thing I really like about this, and it, it shows that I rendered this quick time incorrectly. You, you know, when I, I showed you on the Bell montage one, there was the, the 709 yeah. and the 60, the 701, 709 and the 601. Uh, Color transcode uh, sequences. We've got the same thing here, but it's much easier to see on here. So this started life as a 709 uh, signal, and I transcoded it using QuickTime. QuickTime often does this. QuickTime often renders everything with the Rec 601 uh, numbers, and so that's why we can't see a grey patch in the middle of the red there. If you if you look over at uh, my monitor over here. I can see it on there. It's too far away for you to see on this we'll nice take your work. broadcast yeah. monitor over here. But on here, we can't see a grey patch in the middle of the red, but we can in the middle of the green. So what that means is my nice Rec 709 uh, 720p raster material has been rendered for display using the Rec 601 numbers. And so we've lost that square there. Again, hard to spot on pictures. You, t- you need a real, yeah. real eagle-eyed colorist to spot that. Uh, but uh, and, and if, if the reverse happens, if we had Rec 601 pictures that were being rendered using the Rec 709 numbers, we'd we'd, we'd lose that grey square there. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there are there's a few other things on here. Uh, a nice aspect of this test signal is that we've got graduated video noise in these in these columns here, starting at oh, neg. So 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 uh, you, you can't. Really, it's, it's hard to spot, but take my word for it. So starting at neg twenty dB midpoint, we've got calibrated video noise here, going up to neg forty something dB midpoint uh, calibrated video noise here, which. If you were setting up a compression encoder, is a, is a is a useful thing to have calibrated video noise, because uh, the first yeah. thing you set up is the noise core, and you want to know, you know, based on your service level agreement, where you're coring the noise on your picture. Um, you know, again, we've got the one six seven and the one eight five and two three nine flat uh, cinemascope aspect ratio markers here for when people crop things for digital cinema. We've got precise markers with a, a moving. Uh, 
a moving um, uh, single pixel wide marker at all, at all the common broadcast and digital cinema aspect ratios. So you can see if your encoder has cropped you know, even one pixel incorrectly. You know, you can make sure that things have been cropped exactly correctly as they should be. And you know, there's a, there's a few other things here. As I say, we've got we've got the we've got the lip sync tick as it goes back through the center there. Uh, this one does a rather nice job of it because on this one, uh, uh, against those 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 ones that, that I found on YouTube, which are all very good. There's a really good BBC one. Uh, this one. Is a uh, is a is a is a chroma dot going that direction and a luma dot going in that direction. So if it's if something uh, is 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 field based, uh, this I rendered this out as progressive. But if something was field based, um, and your you've got field inversion errors, you have field cadence problems. Uh, the single dot becomes two dots, and it's very immediately obvious that you've got field See, yeah. cadence issues. So. Uh, you know, these are all the kind of things that, that you'd never see on color bars. You'd never see on a Tektronix screen. But they're all the things that are uh, that bedevil us because of the nature of what we do with video now. We pass it through encoders. We pass it through, you know, edit workstations that are using, you know, whatever the codec du jour this week is, you know, H.264, <laughs> ProRes, Avid DNX, you know, whatever, whatever the, 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 you know, Sony XD Cam, 50 megabit, whatever, you know, AVC intro, whatever the funky codec is that people want to use. Um uh, you, you know, those codecs, they do brilliantly with color bars. You, you know, you never, you know, they never mess up color bars, but uh, they do, they, they do cause a problem when we're talking about um, uh, compressed material or, or, or these kind of slightly more esoteric things that, that we need to deal with nowadays. It's not just about uh, legality, as we were saying earlier on. Uh, signals will make it through the chain uh, much better than they used to. But because the workflows are so complicated and it is so potentially possible uh, to be getting material that's been processed on different workstations um, uh, with all sorts of different uh, uh, sort of processes happening to them, having some references that you can put through that actually uh, do test the system uh, are really essential, actually. Yeah. Um, even if you can't run to um, you know, the Sarnoff Labs uh, super duper one there are some free uh um, yes free tools out there that you can make use of that there absolutely are and 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 the thing is uh you know you might be sitting in your facility saying oh but we're you know we're a file based facility we don't do any of this baseband video nonsense all these things are available as files and yeah. uh you know that's where the tr trouble happens in the file domain uh you know uh you know download one of these things and when, or, and, and when you're satisfied that you, you play it out uh, yes your broadcast monitor put it through your new workflow you, you know and 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 and, uh, and see, see what it's doing just see yes, what it is absolutely. and, and uh, rather staggering you know, there are some brilliant ones on youtube this is this is one i used to use an awful lot that the bbc audio sync test um Oh, well, this one's even got a BBC ident at the head of it. So there we go. <laughs> um, you know, and they really try hard to draw your eye to the fact that when you hear the tick, you know, it should be when the when, when this thing bashes there and when that thing goes through there. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I so, so there's one machine room uh, I've done a lot of work in, uh, technically in Pinewood. They have a very big, long machine room. And from one end of the machine room, you can see... Uh, getting on towards a frame of delay. It's probably 40, no, 30 odd meters, you know, right. the end. and and so a frame of delay is is uh, is kind of noticeable, you know, and with, with the big monitor down one end, you know, oh, you think, oh, I'm, I'm seeing a frame of delay because I'm so far away from the monitor. But, uh, yeah. uh, you know, obviously the, the expectation is you look at these things close up. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Well, fantastic. It, 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 it beholds us. Unfortunately, the digital world has made life so easy that it's easy to forget that in order to make this happen, we've had to introduce compromise after compromise after compromise. If you get everything lined up correctly and checked through, you're going to be fine. If you don't, uh, and just assume the digits all work for you, you will come unstuck. And it's the day you come unstuck that you have a problem with the client. Um, <laughs> That's that's the awful one. So these are great. This is really useful tools. And uh, it, 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 it is just so hard, isn't it, to 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 to, yeah. to, 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 to tell people, uh, you know, who aren't particularly technical, who who could have grasped the idea of uh, uh, of um, you know poor response of a cable or something. Yeah. You know, just some of these things are so subtle um, that uh, you know the time you want to be figuring out that you've got this subtle problem is not 
you know, when you're apologising to the client. But, you know, the day before they had it started. Yes. You know, yes. and and uh, just kind of... Uh, let's see, Bell New Montage uh, test chart is, is uh, you know, is a stormer. It looks very, very simple. Yeah. And in fact, there's a, they have a great write-up of, to what all these things do. So, uh, you know, the, the, there's the colour space encoding tabs, you know, and what, what you can expect to see uh, when uh, when those things are wrong, uh, you, you know, so so uh, so that, yeah, that's a good freebie. All the all the lip sync ones are good freebies, and uh, you know, with with a bit of effort, you could you could brew a lot of these things yourself. As I say, the the the, the, the Sarnoff SRI visualizer is an expensive piece, uh, particularly if you buy the hardware version, um, but uh, it just has everything included, and yeah. um, you know, it's uh, it, it, it it's definitely a good one. Fantastic. Well, Phil, thank you so much. That's been really, really interesting. Jolly good. As I say, you, you, you been, I'm, I'm back in the Route 6 workshop. Our, our, uh, our, uh, we've, we've suddenly got very, very busy. We've got three installation oh, cool. jobs on the go at the moment. So, uh, you know, um, I don't think any of them have got anything particularly innovative or interesting. But uh, but we uh, we have got a job uh, further afield in, uh, in in the Middle East uh, coming up, which I think will have some interesting things to, uh, to talk about oh. in a subsequent podcast. Yeah. Well, look forward to that one as well. So, thank you, Phil. Jolly good. We will uh, we'll talk again soon, chap. Reconvene at the next one. Bye bye now. <laughs> Reconvene. <laughs>